have a meeting and we use our script Bibles because this is, we are convinced that this is God's word and what God has to say for you and me is really important to know. And um, it's just like light for us in a dark world. The psalmist said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And I know you'll find that to be true today. We're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the family of God today. And uh, the, the Paul's letter in Romans has led us into this subject as he's been concerned about us individually, but also connected, because that's how we are in God's eyes. Connected to God through the Lord Jesus Christ and connected to those who believe in him. We are family. And uh, I don't know, family is one of God's greatest inventions. I, you know, when family is working right, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Sometimes, uh, sometimes it's a bit dysfunctional, right? Some of you, uh, uh, my, my theory on this is that in some way or another, every single family is dysfunctional, and, uh, but some are really quite obviously dysfunctional, and hopefully you didn't, don't live in one of those. But uh, if you do, God's grace will carry you through if we'll do it his way and uh, let Christ love us and love others through us. We can see some amazing things. God is in the fixing business. You know, there's a lot of brokenness in this world and God's a fixer. You know, and so I, I just encourage you to cast your care upon him because he does care for you. Uh, we're going to... Um, we're going to go to the book of Hebrews today, and uh, we're going to go to chapter 10. Now, if you come tonight, we'll be in chapter 11, but I want to look at a passage here uh, that, that talks about our community in Christ. And uh, the writer of Hebrews here, the Holy Spirit, is uh, giving us some, some good information here about how we can be successful in, in our relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. So uh, this, these passages that we're going to look at, they all begin with let us. Now if you, I, I mention this almost every time that, uh, that I see that little word let. Uh, because I think it has tremendous significance. You know, I mean, God is almighty God. He sits on the throne. He's the sovereign of the universe. Uh, who can stand before him? And, and this, this encouragement, this, this, these admonitions point out that God is respecting your choice in this matter. Now, it might not be a, we make the right choices, but God respects us and his, what he has put into place, that he has given you responsibility. Now, let me just remind you something about this. This is like when the doorbell rings, um, and let's say that you're, you are not handy, and um, the bathroom water is flowing out into the bedroom, into the hallway and everything. And that person who rings the doorbell is the plumber, okay? Now that plumber is not going to break the door down. He's not going to come in and fix it. You have to let him into your house to do that. You know, God can fix and change anything in our lives. But... But he's not going to break the door down. He's not going to run over you. You're going to have to say, Lord, I want you to come. I want you to do this. I surrender to you. Please help me. And this is what Jesus said. Without him, we could do nothing. So see yourself as, as nigh unto helpless as far as being successful in most things and God being perfectly able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. But notice the let in each one of these. So it says uh, in verse 22, verse 22 of Hebrews 10, 
It says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, the writing to the Hebrew believers he uses terms that they're familiar with. But I want you to know that what Ephesians 5 tells us is that Jesus Christ loves us and he has washed us with the water of the word. God is in the fixing and the cleansing business. And we need to lean upon him. But what he says to us here is to draw near. Let us draw near. Let's make that decision. Let's put that God first and let's pursue God. God told Israel, you'll seek me and you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. You know, um, God does not deserve second, third, fourth place in our lives. He, he only deserves first place. And, and uh, you know, this is something that is so wonderful for us. You know, in the beginning, Adam could walk with God. God would come down and he would walk. And they had this wonderful communion. And then Adam disobeyed God and sin entered the world and death in that communion was broken. And the only way that Adam and his descendants could, could approach God was through sacrifice, reminding them of sin and death. And so they had to bring a sacrifice. And they had to bring a sacrifice. They couldn't just come. Could you imagine at your house, you know, uh, guys, if, if uh, your wife couldn't come and talk to you unless you brought a burnt offering? Now, some of you might be used to that at dinner time. I don't know. But, but they had to bring a, a sacrifice in order to approach God. And it was acknowledgement that they were sins. But Jesus has died on the cross. He has paid the debt we owed. And now we can come with confidence before God. We who trust Christ are members of his family. And, uh, you know, I, I, I gives my age here, but I remember... Uh, from uh, I think it was on the cover of Life magazine or something like that but they had a picture of John F. Kennedy in the Oval Office at that desk working and you could see underneath his son John okay I don't know if any of you remember that picture but how many kids in the whole universe could play under the president's desk there were only two and John it was there and, and, and he was welcome there. If you have trusted Christ, you are children of God, and you can climb up into your father's lap and tell him what's on your heart and mind. The door is open because you're family. You see that? Christ has done that for you. And since he's done that for us, let us draw near. Wouldn't it be sad to have this access to God that we do through Christ Jesus and not avail ourselves to it? To have, uh, to be able to fellowship and commune and seek help from the God of this universe, our Heavenly Father, who's a good, good Father, isn't he? And never to go and talk to him, never to come before his presence with thanksgiving, never, never pour out our heart to him, never commune with him, never seek to honor him. The Bible says, draw near. This is, this is not some impersonal God that's just powerful and makes stuff this is a person who loves and he loves you and so the admonition here is to draw near to God now this is really important for you okay this is your privilege if you've trusted Christ as your savior and you were made for him and you don't live right without him face it we become most like the people we hang around with and, and, and it showed with the disciples, you know, in the early Acts, these guys are crazy. They're just Galileans. They shouldn't know any of this stuff. And they took note that they had been with Jesus. People ought to take note. They will take note when we draw near to God. They, it'll, they'll notice. Maybe we won't glow like Moses when he came down from the mountain, you know, you know, let's put a veil over that so I don't scare people away. But, but there is, there, it's noticeable when we have been with, with Jesus. Now, this is, this, can, this is an individual thing, but you're not an individual disconnected. You are connected to a family. 
And this is really, really something that you owe to your church family, that you draw near to God. When you draw near to God and you come, you bring something special. You have something more to offer to your, family, your church family than otherwise. You know, when we spend all week in the world, so to speak, uh, and we come to church, we come really needy. And uh, so we're like taking while we're here, you know? Would you encourage me? Would you pray for me? Would you... Would, and and, and, and it, not that, that we all don't do that sometimes, but I'm saying that we come and we don't have what we should have to offer, to minister, to give to others, because we haven't been drawn near to God. It's reflected in our family when we gather together if we have drawn near to God. When you show up and you've been spending time with God during the week, it shows and it encourages the worship. It encourages the fellowship. It encourages your brothers and sisters in Christ. So, you know, that harmony is from God and we need to spend time with, with God. Draw near to Him. Draw near to God. It's your privilege. It's your, it's your right. It's been, a, it's been purchased for you by a great price. Don't, don't throw that away. So draw near with full assurance of faith. If, do you understand this? Don't let devil, the devil take this from you. God's not mad at you. God doesn't dislike you. God loves you. He cares about you. He wants you to commune with Him. That's why His Son died for you. I mean, how could, how could He give such a price for me? For you. This is a God worth knowing. And someone by the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, His Son, access through His Son, Jesus Christ, we can, we can draw near to Him. And we ought to. So let us. Let us. Choose to do that this week. Draw near to God. You know, and sometimes we have to just uh, find a place, a time, and get off and open up our Bible and say, God, I know you're here. Let me experience that. Verse 23, Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who is promised is faithful. All right, this, this Paul talks about it in, in, uh, in Ephesians 6, as we saw last week, he talks about the adversary that we have. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We're, we're talking about spiritual forces of darkness and they come and resist us. When we believe on Christ, we become a target. We, we be, is the adversary resists the word of God, the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit, the plan of God, the, the worship of God. He resists those things. And when we identify with Christ, we become a target for him. And, uh, and that's why maybe you've noticed, you know, uh, some... there. Before I trusted Christ, none of these things bothered me, and, and this, this, that, and the other. And it seems since I've trusted Christ, I've got new problems I didn't have before. Well, I'm sorry you didn't read the fine print when you trusted Christ. <laughs> but, but that's, it's worth it. It's worth it. But you become a target. Now, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Satan cannot defeat you. He, he, has, he has no power to do that. You are safe in Jesus. But sometimes, instead of letting us do what we should do, we let Satan do what he wants to do. Because he needs permission also. You know that? And so don't give it to him. We need to, how do we stand? Jesus resisted Satan with the word of God. Martin Luther wrote that old great song and he said about the adversary, one little word shall fell him. He cannot stand to the truth. He's a liar. And so, but we're defenseless. 
All right, we, we want to run to God and we want to spend time with him. Well, we have to know what, who God is and, and, and trust this faithful God who is promised. And that means the Holy Spirit wants us to spend time in his word. And, and don't doubt in the dark what God has shown you in the light. This, this God is faithful. He's with us. You know, the psalmist in the uh, 139th Psalm is so wonderful. Where can I go from your presence? God's there all the time. But you don't feel him all the time, do you? You don't see him all the time. It, it, it's got to be faith. And you have to stand on what God has promised. Why? Because the one who called you is faithful. And so don't waver in that. Don't, don't allow Satan's fiery darts of doubt to, to have any impact on your life. Faith resists and protects us. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Listen, this has happened over and over. Somebody has challenged what the Bible says and they have scoffed at it. Somebody it, it wrote this before and is so uh, accurate. The, the, the Bible is an anvil that's worn out many hammers. And it's been attacked and then attacked, but it stands. The Bible stands, and you can stand on what God has said. He is the way, He's the truth, He's the life. His word is established in heaven. It stands forever. And what God has promised you about your future, it's true. And, and, and the world cannot take from you what God has given. They cannot. And so hold fast. <laughs> Stand on what God has said. Not on the reasonings and the philosophies of this world. They only enslave us, Colossians 2.8 says. But what God has promised, it provides us with a sure foundation. Remember Jesus' words as he talked about a wise man? He didn't build his house out there on the sand. He built his house upon the rock. Jesus is the rock. The word of God is sure and we can trust him. And we need to hold on to this. You want to walk through this world with victory? Well then spend time with God, draw near to him, and stand on what God has said in his word. That's the admonition. Now how does that relate to others? Well the church needs that so much. There's a... There was an old preacher, uh, J. Vernon McGee. He, he, he was so worried, uh, not worried, but he, he was dis despondent about the lack of Bible knowledge in our country. Now that was years ago. You know, we have Christians who go to church, sing the songs, you know, but they do not, they're not established in their faith by what God has said in his word. And we are weak, we're vulnerable when we're that way. And you being vulnerable are not what your church family needs. Now you're welcome. Come, come. But you have something to offer when you come and uh, you are standing on the promise of God. You, you are a blessing to your church family. And then the, uh, the last verse, and uh, it's like preaching to the choir, isn't it? Verse... Uh, 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. I like the King James. It says provoke. That's more natural for me. I like provoking. But stir it up. You know, uh, I'm kind of a peacemaker type guy. And, and I let some things just go. Somebody says something that's wrong. I might just, well, oh well. I don't really feel like getting into it right now. Now my wife, she doesn't let it go. She, you know, if somebody is, if some of y'all know her on uh, social media and everything, she, she, she has an opinion. And most often her opinion is based upon what she understands from God's word. And I really respect that. And uh, you know, Jesus, wherever he went, he stirred things up. All right, he's the Prince of Peace, but he brought the truth, and the truth divided, and it offended, and it stirred things up. Okay, you know, we need to really pray about Grace Bible Church. You know, I don't know if we're causing enough trouble in this world. 
We need to work harder at that, don't we? No, we don't have to work at causing trouble. We just need to stand on the truth and proclaim the truth. And, you know, some people will find that extremely offensive. And that seems to be the worst thing you can do in the world today is offend somebody, right? All right. Let us consider one another. Now, you can think about people all the time. I mean, you know, every waking moment you can be thinking about. So you can be out on the boat fishing. You can be out on the ninth hole chipping. Whatever you want to do. You, and you can be thinking about people in your church family, right? But, but there's something that we... This consider is more active than thinking. Now... Praying for one another, I covet your prayers. I think, I, I love to hear, Pastor, I'm praying for you, and I think, hallelujah. I want people to pray for me. I, I know you want me to pray for you. We want to pray for one another. But this consider one another goes beyond the, the uh, thinking about. And because it requires stirring up to love and good works. You know, you can pray for me and think about me. And uh, in fact, you can go home and have roast pastor over lunch if you want to. But, but for you to s provoke me to love and good works, you need to be active in my life. You, you, ne you need to be, I need to be in your presence for you to do that. And, and this is what this is about. Verse 25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. So in order for me to, to fulfill the purpose that God has for me, I need to meet with other Christians. And it doesn't say how often. You know, um, if, if I wrote the book, I'd say at least four times a week. You know, that's what I would say. But I didn't write the book. I have no, I don't have a scripture that tells you, but as we, we need to see that we have two ministries in this world. One is with the world. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are a light in a dark place. And you know, we're out there all the time, aren't we? Okay, you go to work, you go to the shopping center, you, whatever you're doing, you're in contact with the world and we need to bring the love and the light of Jesus, the truth to them. But there's another group that we're ministering to and that's right here in this building. You're part of a family and you minister to one another. And so I, I, I love family because we see each other every day. Church family, we don't get to see each other every day. Maybe that's why we like each other better than family. But... <laughs> <laughs> but, but we need, the, the, this, this is something that's necessary, not just for you, it is necessary for you. you. God designed you as a child of God to be connected in a family and to be in fellowship with others. But he designed you for others. You say, I don't have anything to offer. Hogwash. Especially if you're drawing near and you're holding fast, you've got a lot to offer. But, I don't think you understand. Just your presence today, just you sitting there, if you didn't do anything, if you were like a bump on a log and you came and sat there, that would be a blessing to somebody. It would be to me. Your presence is more powerful than you think. And now we want to go beyond being a bump on a log, but, but that's a start. That's a start. Because, you know, some people don't, don't gather, it says. The manner of some is. But we need to be exhorting one another. And that's talking about interacting with one another spiritually. Okay? Around communion with God, communion with His people. So much the more as you see the day approaching. I'm not going to do a... In the last minute, I'm not going to do a prophecy lesson here. But if you read your book and you listen to things, how in the world could we be here much longer before the Lord Jesus comes back? I don't know. 
Now, he knows. I don't know. But I tell you, every day you think, I need to get up on my toes because perhaps today Jesus is coming back. And so we need to, we need to draw near and we need to hold fast and we need to uh, consider one another. Okay? So there's just three things that he instructs us to do that will bless our church family and it will bless you. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you now for our time together.